Thank you. Don't make this make this any harder. I'm I'm terrible with speeches. All right. But uh, I do want to thank the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for this, uh, this acknowledgement. But yeah, most importantly, um, I want to thank the fans, because the fans are the ones that made it possible for us to get together tonight. The fans, the fans have been there since the beginning. We've got new fans that have never seen the original lineup, and they're still rooting for us. So. But I also, I also want to take a second. I also I got to uh, give credit where credit's due. I got to thank my wife as well, because when when all the drama was going on, I started to succumb to like, you know what, fuck it. She said, you know, just go do it for the fans. And I said, you know what, you're right. So I gotta give her credit. And then, also, I wanna mention a couple people who were really responsible for taking this derelict, fucked up, dysfunctional van and seeing something in it and uh, going to the mat to get us signed and get us out there. And that was uh, Tom Zutat and uh, Teresa Insonat from Geffen Records. Uh, early on, it was Vicki Hamilton who tried to manage us with all her heart. And, uh, and, and ultimately, Alan <coughs> Niven, who was the guy who was uh, really the one that helped pull it all together and get us out there. We became the band that, 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 uh, that, that <laughs> was born to lose that actually made it. So I want to thank all of them. But thank you all, and uh, let's go play. Welcome to another Road to Hollywood. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've got a very special show. And just that indication right there, it's, uh, it's all about uh, Guns N' Roses going forward, going back. We've got some special guests in the studio, and we're going to be talking about what they're doing today. Um, as Slash mentioned right there, someone very instrumental in the early days of that band coming together and becoming uh, what they became. And that is their uh, original manager. Welcome, Vicki Hamilton, The Road to Hollywood. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. And we have the Walking Encyclopedia. Of course, he, he grew up with Slash. He can tell you stories uh, like no one other. He is the author of the book, Reckless Road. He is uh, a fixture in Hollywood, and we're proud to have him to tell us all the great stories about Slash and Guns N' Roses development. He is Mark Cantor. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Well, let's get right into it. We just saw the guys last year get inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we knew it started in a whole nother level. Vicki, why don't you tell us a little bit about when you first met the band? Who called who? Where did you see them? Tell us about the, the original meeting and, and what you saw in them. Um, Axel called me when I was working as a booking agent at a place called Silver Lining Entertainment and um, <clears throat> said that I came highly recommended and he wanted me to like book some shows for them. But at the time, they were Hollywood Rose. And um, I was like, okay, cool. Send me a CD. I'll like check it out. And he's like, no, no, I want to come down there and play it for you. And I'm like, well, that's kind of impossible. And he's like, why? And I'm like, well, I don't have a stereo down here. And he's like, well, I'll bring a ghetto blaster and play it for you. And I laughed and I was like, okay, come on down, you know. So a few hours later, he and Izzy showed up, ghetto blaster in hand, and um, played me demos that were some of the songs that ended up on Appetite for Destruction and um, I booked them sight unseen they were pretty amazing you know so that that was the humble beginnings you you they played you songs you said okay you can play and basically you saw something in them first time you saw them that you said hey these guys really got something and how did it all gel from there well, I mean, you could hear it on the tracks. It was like, I, at that point in time, Hollywood was very sort of glam, pop, rocky, and there was just something sort of dangerous about Guns N' Roses, and um, it sounded a little more serious, and I loved the sound, so, and it only got better from there. And, and was it all five members, or how soon did it come together to the group that we know? Um, n no, Chris Weber was the guitar player then, and I think it was a different drummer as well. Um, but it was Izzy and Axel. I'm not sure if Duff was in yet or not. Mark probably no, knows no. more D than Duff that. Duff wasn't yeah, in yet. That yeah. was still Hollywood Rose. Yeah. Well, again, we got the fact checker in the, in the house here. So 
Um, now, we know you go way back before <coughs> this, Mark. So tell us again the first time you met Slash and the friendship you developed and what you saw in him as a early early kid. Well, I actually met Slash. We went to grammar school together probably in the f- 1976, like the fifth grade. And um, he was actually trying to steal my motorbike that was parked right in front of a KFC on 3rd and Fuller in Los Angeles. And then he looked inside and saw it kind of recognized me from school but we didn't know each other but he had seen my face so he figured rather than try to steal it maybe he'll just make friends with me and i'll let him write it so he went that route and it worked out we became friends turned out we only lived a block away from each other and we started hanging out and riding bicycles together and you know bmx and his drawings were really good back then i noticed that he had talent with that and he had talent on his bike he hadn't started playing guitar yet and um, a couple of years later, when he picked up the guitar, that's when we saw that right away there was a lot of feel coming out of him. And we knew that that was going to be his calling. So I started documenting him, you know, back 1980, 1981. Now, did he have musical training before that? Was he playing any instruments before guitar or was that the first? No, he actually went to take bass lessons. Uh, he thought he wanted to play the bass. And his guitar teacher, Robert Wallen, said, uh, well... The bass has four strings, the guitar has six, and so he took guitar. He figured there'd be more of a challenge, more sounds can come from this. And he took lessons for about three months, I think, just to learn the basics. Mm -hmm. And then he just took off with it. He just, you know, was self-taught based on what Robert had taught him, and he just knew how to take it from there. And before he could play fast, it didn't matter. The notes he was choosing to play were, like I would play rhythms, he'd come to my house, we'd plug into our pig nose, and he would go off and start playing leads. And it was just ripping a hole in my stomach. Just, I, I'd get chills. Yet it wasn't, you know, rip, it wasn't shredding leads. It was just like, you know, air clapped in, very slow, but a lot of feel. Uh, so you had soul from the beginning, and you guys weren't playing other people's songs? This was just kind of jamming? No, no, just jamming, uh, you know, blues, uh, uh, riffs. I'd play riffs, blues riffs, and mm-hmm. he would just rip away at them. And, you know, I enjoyed hearing him, so I would play that just so I could hear him, you know, doctor it up a little bit. But soon after that, he started a band, and they'd play cover songs, a couple originals. They never really had a singer. They were called Titus Sloan. Mm-hmm. And... Um, then, uh, you know, at some point, they were looking for a real singer. They, they got somewhat like a childhood friend to sing, but he, he wasn't really pulling it off, and it wasn't working. They never played any clubs, only some parties. Then Slash decided he wanted to go and find, like, a singer that had been played, that the, you know, played the Starwood or the Troubadour, somewhere like that, and bumped into Axel on the way in Izzy. And, you know, they wanted to join that banner join together and i think at that time we went to see rose rose went from hollywood rose back to rose back to hollywood rose and when i saw them with slash and steven i don't know if they were rose or hollywood rose but i know one thing like a week later slash and steven adler joined and they then called it the new hollywood rose they did about four or five gigs over four months and then oh izzy by the way uh, left the band right away is like he was in the band a week and then quit to join a band called London, but then um, after Hollywood Rose fell apart in the su- end of the summer of uh, 1984, Axel had joined up with Tracy Guns and LA Guns and did a couple gigs with them. Slash was looking for a band and eventually found Black Sheep in, in um, May of 1985. So it took him a while to find a band, and um, <coughs> Izzy and Axel ended up doing like a reunion with Tracy and they were it was a side project it was Hollywood Rose and LA Guns going to join together and make a side project you know like one of those power station bands and they decided to just call it Guns and Roses but um, Chris Weber did the first show I don't remember where it was but he did the first show because Slash wasn't able to make it he had to work at Tower Video and then so Slash didn't join that and they got Tracy uh, I'm sorry, there was a Hollywood reunion show that Chris Weber played, and Slash couldn't make it. And then right after that is when they put together Guns N' Roses, and Chris Weber wasn't offered it because it was part of Tracy's. Tracy and Rob Gardner, who was the drummer from L.A. Guns, joined up with Izzy and Axel. They found this bass player named Uli. He only stayed for one gig, and then 
Izzy, uh, Duff was living right across the street from Izzy, somewhere near where the Coconut Teaser is, I believe, mm-hmm. like right off of Laurel Canyon. Yeah. And um, what happened was they got jo- Duff to join. So Duff joined and played maybe two or three gigs. And Duff booked a tour to Seattle because that's where he was from. <coughs> and Tracy and Rob were like, where are we going to stay? Where are we going to eat? What, you know, Because they were like, they always grew up in homes and, and went to school. And Axel and Lizzie were on the streets looking to join bands. So it wasn't really, they weren't going to go to Seattle. So basically what happened was they all, the, the remaining members went to that Black Sheep gig at the country club. It was May 31st of 1985 to persuade Slash after the gig to join their band because they had a band at the, a, a gig booked at the Troubadour on June 6th, which was a week, you know, the following week, mm-hmm. and a tour booked in, you know, Seattle June 8th is when they were going to, you know, head out there. So um, Slash and Steven joined, and uh, Rob and Tracy were out, and that there you have the Appetite for Destru- Destruction lineup. But Duff actually told me recently that if Slash had not joined, he was on his way out. He was, it's not that he didn't like Axel and Lizzie, he just, something just wasn't keeping him there and he was just thinking about leaving. But once Slash and Steven got there, it sucked him right in and they had the musicians they needed to make that lineup work. And the first song that lineup actually wrote together was Welcome to the Jungle and that debuted at the Troubadour uh, July 20th of 1985. And it seemed like every month a new song would come so that was the first song they did together? The first song that the Appetite for Destruction lineup wrote together okay. was that. Now, I heard the first song Guns N' Roses did together was Don't Cry, that Axel and Izzy had written when they first put the band together. Mm-hmm. And then in the next few months before, you know, four months went by before Slash joined. Moved to the city, showed up. Uh, you know, they were playing Reckless and Shadow Your Love already from Hollywood Rose a year before and nice boys don't play rock and roll, and that was already there. But uh, moved I remember to the s- them doing uh, Bang the Drum by Todd Rundgren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were doing like Hair of the Dog and you know different songs like that. But um, so yeah, Think About You and Move to the City, I believe, were the and, and Don't Cry were the three Guns N' Roses songs that were there before Slash joined. And once he joined, then. Welcome to the Jungle came. Then Rocket Queen uh, debuted September 20th at the Troubadour of that same year. So that was like two months after, you know. Mm-hmm. And then right after that, Paradise City at the Troubadour was on uh, October 10th. Was They debuted it. And um, let's see, November 22nd was our first sold out gig. And that was at the Troubadour. And that probably got Vicky's attention once once it was sold out. I actually helped them place an ad for that and that I was helping them with ads and we were doing quarter page ads for two hundred and eighty eight dollars in BAM magazine. But that for that gig we did a full page ad for twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Remember that price? <laughs> and uh that was I had already auditioned slash for poison uh, too prior yeah, the, to that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, Vicky, uh there's yeah, there's a, a, a poison story there because poison had played with Hollywood Rose and Matt Smith, the old guitar player, liked what Slash was doing and became friends and we all had the Aerosmith thing in common because we all liked Aerosmith and when Matt got his girlfriend pregnant and was moving back to Pennsylvania he suggested Slash for the job and Poison was Vicky was had Poison and they were selling on all those clubs and just making the big silly string and everything and Slash couldn't bring himself to join but he still I made him go they to gave the him the gig and he actually said because I was sitting there he's like um Okay, well, I'll do it, but I'm not going to say, hi, my name's Slash, and I won't wear all the makeup. Right, like, right. Yeah. Ba- basically, that's what he said. I, I said it was a good stepping stone for him because even if you don't stay with the band, you might do a record with them or, you know, people will see who you are. You'll find a better gig, but he still wouldn't do it. And at that same audition, he was at CC. He said, I wasn't there at the audition, but he said... Later, he said CC was there, and he said he knew CC would get the gig anyways because CC looked more the part. So that was the that was the slash that happened somewhere before Black Sheep, like after he left Hollywood Rose and before Black Sheep. So I, I'm guessing, you know, and that may, was at the Keel rehearsal place, like off of um, somewhere Washington. Be, yeah, somewhere Washington. in the winter of '84 yeah. and to spring of '85. But then back to Guns. So they wrote Paradise City. You know, Paradise City was put together, and all these songs sound like the record the first time they played it, right down to the guitar solo. Um, yeah, so their they didn't first meet, demo was amazing. They I mean, didn't need any producing. Yeah. They needed 
engineering to rec- someone to grab the sound really right. very little arranging was done very little uh okay so paradise city october 10th and then first first uh sold that gig at the troubadour was november 22nd december 21st they debuted night train at the music machine mm-hmm. two weeks later they had a sold out gig at the troubadour january 4th of uh, 1986 and they debuted my michelle so they were on a roll and you know, then Vicky started getting involved with them right around that time, and um, then they played another sold out gig at the Roxy. That was one of the first gigs that I started videotaping, and that was January 18th. And Vicky was in charge with, of them at that time, and um, nothing was debuted at that song except a song called "Good Night Tonight" that Izzy had put together that they only played for that one show, and they never played it again. Uh, after that. There was some tr- trouble where they were living in the studio, and there was some rape charges, and they had a hideout in Vicky's house, and so they put together Out to Get Me, based on the cops looking for them. And that debuted at the gig that Tom Zutat showed up at, which Vicky Hamilton helped get him there, and that was uh, February 28th, so that might, of 1986, that might be their most important gig. Although Tom did show up at the Roxy gig, but couldn't get in because fire marshals wouldn't let him in. It was so overpacked. And Guns N' Roses had swapped with L.A. Guns at the last minute. L.A. Guns was opening, but Guns N' Roses decided they wanted to go on earlier instead, and L.A. Guns played after them. So Tom finally did get in, missed the GNR show, but he saw L.A. Guns, and Axel got up and did uh, the cover of an Aerosmith song um, off Toys in the Attic, uh, Adam's Apple. With, uh, with L.A. Guns. So, so Tom did get to see just one speck of, you know, glimpse of Axel at, at that gig, but it was the next gig that... Yeah, all the A&R there. people were at the Troubadour. There was maybe 12 A&R people there, and they were all standing outside because it was so loud, I remember. Wow. Yeah, Tom Zutat said to me, if that guy can really sing, I'll sign him. I was like, oh, well, he can really sing. And yeah, Tom said he left after three songs. He knew he, he wanted the band, but he didn't want to give it. He, he wanted a poker face. He didn't want the, uh, they were all looking to see what he wanted, you know, what, he, what his, they were trying to read his eyes. And the fact that he left early, they figured, eh, maybe they're no good. You know, they, they weren't really sure what to think about it because Tom, Tom played it smooth and left after three songs. So, but after that, there was a, you know, they got signed, they got a little bit of money, not a lot, but like they each had like 7,500 bucks, but that was a lot of money to them. And they instantly bought equipment, clothes, and more drugs. And they went into a dark period. And tattoos. For, and tattoos. <laughs> Axel got his victory or death tattoo the day he got his money. I remember touching it that day at the Roxy. They did a, a two shows at the Roxy on, Jan, on uh, March 28th. There were supposed to be showcases for record companies, but... Tom already scooped them up two days before that show on March 26. But anyways, Axel had the victory or death tattoo, and I remember rubbing the scab on it. Um, they blew through their money. They became dark. And it was a dark period. Nothing got done songwriting-wise except You're Crazy was debuted at a little club on Hollywood called Raji's. It's no longer there. Sure. And um, they played that in the dark. There was no lights on. It was just completely dark. I tried to videotape it, but you couldn't really see anything. Um, they debuted that show. And then they got a little bit... Then they went back into their dark zone, and they got very creative in August. And they came up with Brownstone and Sweet Child of Mine. And I'm telling you, pretty much note for note, like how the record sounds. The only leads that are different are the end... Of the, after the end at Sweet Child, the leads are a little different. Other than that... All those guitar leads are the same. Same with Brownstone. And they debuted even another song that night called, it was August 23rd at the Whiskey, called um, Ain't Going Down. That only made it on the pinball machine that they released in 1994. (laughs) (laughs) It was recorded for uh, Use Your Illusions, but it became an outtake, and that was that. After that, they went into pre-production. That's when Tom Zutet said, okay, now you could record, because... They, he was looking for one more song, and they gave him Brownstone and Sweet Child. That was it. While they were rehearsing to get the band tighter to go in the studio so they wouldn't waste time, uh, they came up with It's So, it's so Easy, which was written by uh, like Duff and this, their friend Wes Arkeen had something to do with it. And that was just like, that was the, that was the, the you know, that was like, the, that just finished it. After they had that song, they had it, you know, that was it. 
they went into pre you know they went into production around December of 86 <coughs> and they were done in March and it was done incredible tell us Vicky what what that evolution was like for you obviously the band was dangerous they seemed unhinged something was going to happen at, at any time but what tell us that that evolution when when you saw them the record companies coming obviously you, you knew they had something but what was your gut feeling well <clears throat> well all the labels were calling and we went out to dinner with most of them and <laughs> tried to go to the most expensive restaurant in town and um <coughs> we had a lot of really good dinners and did a lot of meetings at the record companies and you know i had worked motley Crue, so i kind of had seen how that went down so i knew that this was on a similar role i mean you know they were dangerous and you knew you were watching a train wreck but you couldn't really like take your eyes off of it and it was different and special you know that's that's incredible and and this is before the internet before cell phones before all that that's what's amazing is this was just pure word of mouth that the band was creating around town between the troubadour and the roxy and all this obviously band magazine was around i don't know if there's any write-ups but this was truly fans talking well th there was some write-ups uh <laughs> there was a little some controversy with music connection <laughs> you remember that uh they got the cover of music connection the same month they got signed but before they got signed okay. and uh it was in march and uh which is the the biggest thing you could wish for as you know a band Every 7 11 they're out there in the stadium. and something went wrong with they didn't like the person interviewing them and you know they they all did it and they were joking around and for whatever reason axel didn't want that issue to come out he wanted to cancel the their whole interview the cover shoot how soon after the interview Right, 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 right. right, after, right. Like the music connection weeks. worked quick. I, I yeah. believe. I, I don't know if they, they were, were every week weeks. or every two weeks. Every two were, weeks. were they still every two weeks back then? Okay, yeah. so, so yeah. they worked pretty quick to get a magazine out every two weeks. So, you know, it just happened. But um, somehow the band convinced him to let it go, and he just, you know, he just. It goes to show you that he never changed. People think he changed later on. He, Axel, if it's not right, he doesn't want it. You know, there's no wine before it's time, and. For whatever reason, he just didn't feel it, and it was the biggest opportunity they could have. He was walking away from it. And this was a feature story. He, feature story. It ran with a little note that says, "This feature runs against with the wishes of okay. yeah okay. W. Axel Rose." Wow. But then Axel got to write a rebuttal for the next issue that they printed in, in the little letter section about why, what was I forgot what it said, but. I remember he wanted to discredit me completely, basically. <laughs> so, I don't remember what it said, but yeah. it goes to show you that that's where, he, you know, Axel's always been the same person. He has never changed. Mm -hmm. He's exactly who he is. It is. It's what his tattoo says. It's victory or death. There's nothing in between. There's no compromise. Wow. Well, we're just getting started. We've got Vicki Hamilton, the original manager of Guns N' Roses, besides... You know, Motley Crue and Poison, all sorts of other incredible legendary bands. And we have Mark Canner, childhood friend of Slash, the author of Reckless Road, and Endless Stories. Uh, I don't think any band of this stature has ever been documented like Mark has done. So we're really proud to have these guys. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about how this grungy, derelict band sleeping on the floors of Hollywood made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and sold hundreds of millions of CDs and albums. So we're coming right back with The Road to Hollywood. This is a message from IES right here. Hey, what up? This is Corey from Slipknot. This is Matt Sorrell from Velvet Revolver. What's up? It's your boy, Mac 10 Hey, this is Mike Ness from Allison Chains. What's up? This is Be Real from Cypress Hill. What's up? I'm Sean from Yellow Card. This is your boy, Warren G. I'm Brooks Wackerman from Bad Religion. Hey, yo, this is Method Man. This is Mick Jones from Barna. And I got a question for you. Are you serious about moving your creative career forward? Then you need to be at IES. If you're a musician out there, you got a band, you want to rock, 
Don't sit down on your ass and wait for someone to knock on your door. You can do it yourself. Don't wait for nobody. Do your thing, man. You know, life is short. You only live once. Totally independent and I love it. Everything's important about the indie world. It has been for a long time. You got more control and you make 10 times as much money. 10 times more money. Don't wait for the record label, do it yourself. People need to hear the music that's in your head, that's in your fingers, that's in your heart. So get out there and let's hear it. Because of the internet and because of the uh, greed of those old school executives at these record companies, the power is now in your hands, artists. Take back your art and don't sell yourself cheap or short to anyone. If you believe in your music, if you believe in your gift, if you believe what God has given you, make sure you go to IES, show the world what you got. It's gonna be going down here in Los Angeles, and it's it's something that gets all you independent artists getting going on that drive, doing what you guys gotta do, man. Be independent. Don't be afraid to be independent. You gotta be a part of doing you first, and that means independence. I implore you to go to the IES, the Independent Entertainment Summit, and do your thing. If you think you know what you're doing in this music business, I don't care who you are, there are things you will learn. The indie way is the way, you know? The large corporations have basically disintegrated. They're looking to the indie community to create the music and create the genesis of what's going to be the next environment. If you started a new band and you're having a little bit of trouble figuring out where to go next or what you should be doing, who you should be talking to, whether you need a record label or how to get your music distributed, you need to go to the Indie Entertainment Summit. That's the place where you go to meet industry panel experts. They're going to tell you everything you need to know to get you where you want to be. For me, I spend all of my days and months going around the world educating musicians on how they can better actually release their music and market their music. Part of my mission is part of the way that we can grow the music business. So I'm going to go at all the important summits that I can go to, and the Indie Entertainment Summit is going to be one of the places that I'll be. You want to be educated? You want me to help educate it? You better be there. If you rap, sing, dance, model, DJ, or act, or like myself do comedy, you can't afford to miss this conference. You trying to do your thing in this business, and you tired of waiting on somebody to help you, and all this coming that late, the Indian Entertainment Summit. You know what time it is, man. It's that time, Rolex time. Chasing cash, get money, get care. Shout out to Hit Boy G, Rock Mike, Mickey Mass, Stacey B, and Sir Cup, and we here with the Indian Entertainment Summit, man. Y'all need to be here, man. It's in LA in August, man. Beautiful people here, man, dropping knowledge, dropping gems about this new way to pursue this music and a new way to get this money, man. It's the Indie Entertainment Summit. That's the IES, baby. Very important place to be if you want information to take things to the next level. You may not have access to the internet. It's okay, too. Go there. You have an opportunity, IES. Write it, rap it, produce it, mix it, arrange it, wrap it, sell it. That gives you the power. Every second that you're sitting on your butt waiting for something good to happen, your competition is passing you by. So uh, if you got a dream, go and fight for it and support Indie Entertainment Summit. I need y'all to come out to my city and represent with the Entertainment Indie Summit. It's going down August 1st through the 5th. If you're an independent artist, you're an independent label, you want to get your music out there, you want to network, come out to Los Angeles. All you got to do is if you want to blow up in this industry, go to IES Conference in LA, Google it, you got to be there. Showcases, panels, opportunities, everything that indie entertainment summit does is something that is very much for today's music industry we know how it used to be but we don't know how it's going to be tomorrow but I think the indie entertainment summit is going to be an opportunity for motivated ambitious professionals to meet each other music business is a hard thing to break into so you gotta do what you can check out IES Indie Entertainment Summit you won't be anywhere you need to be at IES man in LA man that's where it's gonna be at it's going down just like that August 1st through the 5th IES man if you ain't going to IES you ain't gonna live to be an artist you know why IES feed your mind feed your soul get a good lawyer they'll teach you which way to go if you're serious about your music where do they need to be you gotta be at IES yo. what's that Indie Entertainment Summit you should check it out at IES.com. Uh, hopefully this will become an annual event that we'll all be going to many years from now. Need to be
me out to IES. That's IES, baby. Going down August 1st through the 5th. You have to check out IES. IES, show the world what you got. Ain't no excuses. It's now or never. It's your chance to show the world what you've got. IES. I hope I see you there. Yeah. Indie Entertainment Summit, man. Sir, uh, we gonna be there. Indie Motherfucking Entertainment Summit. Be there, Jack. IES. Look for it online. The Indie Entertainment Summit. If you really think you got what it takes to stand out, you really want to make sure you stand out, you can show the world what you got at the IES, the Indie Entertainment Summit. IES. It's going to be here in Los Angeles. Entertainment capital of the world. <laughs> if you ain't there, you're nowhere. Welcome back to another Road to Hollywood. We've got a very exciting show tonight. We have Vicki Hamilton. She was the original manager of Guns N' Roses. Worked with Poison, Motley Crue, so many other great groups. She's going to be talking a little bit about some of the artists that she's managing now and some of the great artist development work she does. And we have Mark Kenner. He is the childhood friend of Slash. He documented the rise of Guns N' Roses from a garage band in Hollywood to being the biggest group in the world at that time and now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as one of the biggest rock groups in history. And Mark, please show us the cover of your book, Reckless Road, and talk about some of the great pictures that you took. Well, yeah, this book, Reckless Road, covers the first 50 gigs that the band played in Hollywood. And um, that's just, I, you know, I saved the flyers and the tickets, and I made sure I took photos of everything and wrote down the dates and recorded the show. So I transcribed what they said between the songs. This is the new one. I just wrote it today, blah, blah, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's very intimate, and you really feel like you're there. I'm not a professional photographer, but I'm an amateur photographer, and I know what I wanted. I'm more of a director, so I know what I wanted. And the photos that I took are very intimate. They're very candid. And, they're, you know, they were my friends. Not only did I like the music, they were my friends. So it was easy. Like, this, you know, this is like a beggar's banquet photo right there that you're looking at. And that was uh, five days before they got signed. And where was that? Is that that was at Fender's Ballroom. Fender's in Long Beach. Yeah, March twenty first, nineteen eighty six. Now, who were they opening for at that? Johnny show? Thunders. Oh, I was there. Yeah. That was incredible. And um, that photo right now you're looking at is from UCLA, and uh, they did a gig. That was the second time they ever played "Welcome to the Jungle." It was a frat party in the daytime. They got offered that job the night before, and they played the Troubadour. Uh, so it's that, that's very raw. Um, just, you know, a bunch of, right now the next photo that's coming is a picture, the only picture I have with me and the whole band, it was from, Robert John shot it, it was from the Appetite for Destruction photo session, I just happened to be in the studio, uh, that was a recording studio where they were recording it, and they were taking pictures, and I thought, you know, I don't have, I have 10,000, maybe 15,000 photos of the band, but never with one with me in it. So I sat in, took the picture, I didn't realize it was going to end up being on the back cover of Appetite. And that was at Rumbo Recorders? Uh, yeah, yeah. So obviously, I'm not on the back cover, but it's the same photo shoot. So sure. that's kind of a, a special photo for me. This next photo, they opened for Cheap Trick um, at Long Beach, uh, 1986, while they just started the recording of Appetite. So it's pretty raw. Uh, Slash only used that guitar for two gigs or two or three gigs, uh, and then um, he hawked it in. <laughs> it was gone. <laughs> Uh, the next photo is actually when they were out of the club scene and already famous. This was from 1989 at the Cat House. It was a week before the Rolling Stones gig. And they it was right here on Highland Avenue. Yeah, they shot that. They also shot It's So Easy a video shoot there, but it is a club gig, so you know I did document it. And uh, in 1989, they only played six gigs, I think, and four with the Rolling Stones and these two, and they might have done two in Japan. So it was a rare time to see the band in 1989. But this, you know, captures them after they were famous. So that this is a little bit different than the rest of my book. Uh, I sell these fine art prints on my eBay store at Mark. Can you could search it for Mark Cantor, one word: M A R C C A N T E R. This is Slash backstage at the Roxy. It's the only photo I took that night. After that, um, I, I mean, that night I videotaped the gig, so I, I, I was in and out with photos. But um, that's just like an intimate moment right before they went on. That was at the height before they got signed. And Vicky's first gig that, of managing them. Mm. Uh, there's Duff at the Troubadour, uh, the, ni uh, the night they debuted My Michelle. That was January 4th of uh, 1986. So that's just, you know, I like the colors in that photo. It's pretty cool. Fantastic. 
this is another sh uh, picture from that same gig and uh, that banner that was in the background. Um, I actually bought that for them and they, they used it for about five gigs and then it disappeared. I wish I still had it. This was at the Cat House too? No, no, this it? is at the Troubadour. Troubadour. Yeah, oh. the night they debuted My Michelle. I remember them watching it off in my swimming pool and that the <laughs> landlord had a complete cow about that. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we got here? Uh, there's a picture of the Troubadour coming up. That was from, uh, I believe that was from their first sold out gig in November 22nd of 1985. It just shows basically the crowd of people, you know, waiting in line to get in for that sold out gig. Not too many people would think to take a picture of the sign and make sure they get the crowd, but that was I was a little bit compulsive, so that was part of my documenting. This was this photo that's coming now is the first time they played the Roxy. They only played for 20 minutes because the band was a little bit late going on. Um, they had to sell 100 tickets, which, which was ridiculous. And you know, half hour before the gig, I was outside selling those tickets for like five bucks a piece, just so we wouldn't eat all the money. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, you know, that's a very, you know, that shot was taken from the side of the stage. I always try to get them from the shoe to the head because that's the way I like to see bands. Like my, Aerosmith was my favorite band and they look good because they lean a certain way. And, you know, uh, Bruce Springsteen looks good from the waist to the head, not full body. So it's what you're into is what you do. So I guess not even thinking about it, I was shooting them like I wanted to see you know everything not just their faces or their shirts sure the full thing now uh where was this one taken? this was a crazy gig that was when i knew the band was going to make it that was at the street scene there was two thousand oh, people wow. it was in 1985 and, and it was the just riot right no no there was two street scene, street scene gigs that they played but that was the first one in 1985 they were supposed to open they were open for a social distortion so there was a lot of punkers in, the, in there nobody knew who guns and roses were and they were supposed to go on at 5.30. They didn't go on till 8 because everything was late. So the punks were just getting crazy and spitting at them. Like, what are these guys doing? I'm waiting for my band. And here these guys come with Les Pauls and, you know, makeup and, and a little glam but still rock. And it's not what they wanted. And they were throwing food at them and shaking the stage. But after, you know, after three or four songs, they had won that crowd over. And they handled, they maintained the stage. They handled that crowd and that after that is when I realized that they can do it. They can play stadiums because what I saw was crazy. Before that, they played for maybe 200 people. Mm -hmm. And this gig, there was 2,000 crazy people, uh, and they basically won them over. Mm. Now, tell us a little bit about the riot. What was that gig? That, that the also, following? by the way, that, that was the first time Slash used the Les Paul in Guns N' Roses at that gig, which she bought from Howie. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened at the following street scene? What caused the following the street scene was uh, a year later. The band had already been signed. They had already been on KMET a little bit and and, K and KNEC. And uh, so there was more momentum. They opened up for Poison, which so it was like, you know, now there was like 8,000 people there probably. And um, people knew who they were. And there was big, giant yellow canisters of water that were made to use to, to be barricades. And somebody was knocking, you know, pushing them over, and the water was shorting out the electrical system. And the fire marshal said, "That's it." So they only played three songs, but it was absolutely nuts. People were throwing things on stage. There was 40, 50 people on stage. It was just a circus. So the fire marshal pulled the plug, and everybody went crazy. That was it. Every the band left, and that was it. But Poison, they cleaned everything up, got everything working, and Poison did play their gig. And I actually videotaped that. <laughs> did, did they get out okay with their gear? Guns N' Roses, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of no. sad though because the street scene was like a really cool thing, Wasn't and now the they can't do it anymore. It's just you know? one knucklehead killed the whole event, yeah. but yeah, that might no, have been it, the last year they did the street scene, is it? I think, I think it, it was, was, yeah. But I, I remember the street scene where you could stand in the middle of a street, and no matter what direction you looked, there were people as far as you could see. It's like a million people downtown, and it was free, and it was the most amazing time. And by the way, you can get the book at RecklessRoad.com or also at my eBay store, like I said before. If you go to eBay and search Mark Canner, one word, you'll see it. Or just search Reckless Road, and I got a bunch of listings on there, so they'll yeah. pop right up. The book is highly recommended. You can't, you know, live without it. If you're a Guns N' Roses fan or just a fan of rock and roll or music in general, to see the evolution of a band literally go from, you know, baby to adult, you know, in those few short years, uh, Mark really 
you know, documented it. Now, now, Mark, what was the what was the exact moment you said I gotta I gotta really start listing everything because obviously you've been taking pictures of Slash, but w- at what day point one, did you really day start? One, day one, way before Guns and Roses, it was Slash who I was following. Okay. When I met the rest of the guys, I realized that they were equally as good, and together they were a force to be reckoned with. So I never I never did anything differently. I saved the very first flyer from the very first Titus Sloan concert. Mm. So and I taped those gigs and I took pictures. So I, nothing changed when I saw. But I did see all these good songs, and to me they were like Led Zeppelin. I thought they can't write a bad song. So it's just it's if they can stay alive, eventually somebody will see this and they will get signed. I didn't think it would be as big. I thought they'd be like Nazareth, you know, have a gold record and be mm-hmm. the underground cool band, maybe have a song on the radio, but. MTV kind of blew that right through the roof, and mm-hmm. the rest is history. Yeah. Vicky no, I mean, when they made that Paradise City video, even though they were opening for Aerosmith, all people saw was them playing the stadium, and they imagined that this is a stadium band at that point. Right. Well, yeah. they were a stadium band at that point. It was so like, let, you Vicky, know, they started to draw Aerosmith right around that time period, and it wasn't a happy day for Aerosmith. Right. Know? Well, of course, I, I was at the... the, uh, the Rolling Stone shows, and I know there was a lot of controversy and everything around that, you know, with Axel and, and the lyrics and everything. Vicki, I mean, it, is it possible to manage this group at, at that point, or was it just you were just trying to shepherd the madness into a, uh, a collective whole? Well, you can't manage the unmanageable, you yeah. know, but um, I tried to, like, keep track of where everybody was and have them at, you know, I mean, we were three hours late to sign the recording contract. It was, you know, quite a job to get them all in one place at the same mm-hmm. time. Now, now, why Geffen? Why, why was the, the deal there better than any, any other of these other labels? Well, I actually wanted to wait to sign until they played that show at the Roxy. They signed with Geffen two nights before the Roxy show where we did we turned the house twice and there were a lot of A&R people that came to that show and were very upset with me but basically Tom Zutat was very smart he um, took them back to his house and played Errol Smith records with them all night long and bought them dinner and the next morning they were living with me at the time the next morning they kind of announced to me that they were signing with Geffen you know so I remember I think I heard Chrysalis offered them more money but they wanted to go with Geffen because they thought they could make a better record with Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the meeting at Chrysalis had not gone too <laughs> smooth a few days prior. So then I think they told they told uh, what's her name uh, if she went down the street naked. <laughs> yeah, Susan Collins, but it wasn't it wasn't Susan. They liked her. It was a uh, Ron Fair that they were not so keen on. Yeah. yeah. Well. Any stories about um, how they chose Mike Clink or, or about the recording of this album? I, I know a little bit about that. Uh, Mike Clink had engineered on um, Strangers in the Night, the UFO, you know, live record, mm-hmm. which is probably one of the best records, Desert Top 5 for sure, even if it wasn't a live record, just on principle. And everyone that was common knowledge, so that guy's got to be good because that's the best you know, sounding record there ever was before Appetite. Um, so he was more of an engineer and he was just now getting into producing. So they thought, Tom thought that would be a perfect match because he knows how to capture the sound and he it wasn't big headed. So he listened to the band, heard what they were about and knew how to grab it. So he was an engineer. I don't know if he actually engineered it also himself. I think there actually was an engineer, but he, he oversaw it and he made sure it was sounded the way he would have done it himself. So that's why it worked so well with him. So essentially, a lot of these songs as they were written pretty much were were there ready to be recorded. He just captured the best sound uh, of the band. He was smart and didn't didn't get involved. In the 60s, they would have tried to rearrange everything, you know, and, you know, bands didn't have that control, but Guns N' Roses did because they they, they wrote good music that didn't need producing, it needed engineering. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Uh, the music business has changed so much since then. Again, our guests today are Vicki Hamilton, the uh, manager of Guns N' Roses. We're talking about them uh, becoming the band, signing the deal, and becoming you know the history-making group that they were.
before everything imploded. And Mark Cannon was right there. He was documenting his friend Slash. He had all the photos, the videos, the stories, the the ticket stubs and, and the flyers. And we're, we're real excited to have them here tonight. We're going to take another little break, talk to some of the attendees at IS this year where we did a very special uh, uh, documentary performance with uh, Stephen Adler. We did the case study of a success story on Appetite for Destruction. And we're going to come back. We're going to find out what Vicki and Mark are working on today and some of their advice for bands coming up today that hope and dream and wish they're going to be the next Guns N' Roses. Coming right back on the road to Hollywood. From Sisters Doll, and this is my first experience to this wonderful occasion, which is the IES Festival Independent Entertainment Summit. And I believe all you bands out there should definitely come to this because we got the best opportunities on one day. I learned more than I did about the music business in my whole life. And I mean, I'm only 19, so I still got a lot to learn. But in one day, I learned so much. We got to meet people and experience talks by Ricky Rocket from Poison, representatives from Pink Floyd. Mega the bloody motor everything. It was Kiss. just a great kiss. Bloody I love Kiss, they're my favourite band. So all you bands out there come to the Entertainment Summit next year and it's gonna get bigger and better every year. We loved it and it was a great opportunity for us. We're Sisters Doe and we'll see you next time. I guess it's the best if you guys want to meet the people who are gonna launch your career and take it forward. If you guys wanna learn the things you need to learn to get your career off the ground, come to IES next year. This was great, we absolutely loved it. Check us out. There's so many people you can meet on a professional level, personal level. It's really cool to come out here and just have a great time. There's so there's a wealth of information. It's each day you go home tired of how much stuff you've learned. It's going to explode. Yeah. The Indie Entertainment Summit is something that you cannot miss. It's based right here in LA. It's a fantastic opportunity. You'll meet people you never thought you'd shake hands with. It's awesome. We loved it. We'll be back again. Thank you. Hey guys, if you get a chance to check this out, definitely go for it. If you're uh, in a spot where you're uh, um, not signed yet or maybe you are and you have more to learn, there's always more to learn. Come here if you uh, want to meet up with some uh, industry professionals, you get a chance to actually sit down one-on-one uh, -on -one with them at a table, um, get to see some performances, get you know, to make new friends from all over the place. There's dudes from Australia, all the way over from Mexico. I'm from Illinois myself, I flew across the country, so you meet a lot of great people. Bring cards, bring cards that just trade with people, instantly bring some CDs. Um, it's, it's a great, great experience. I, I, would, I would recommend it. Go for it. from Sisters Doll. Um, we've just come in from Australia for this fantastic IES seminar. It has been brilliant. Where are you? You must come here next week. We have had so much success from being at this seminar. We have met legends. We've had some great advice from people from Pink Floyd, from Guns N' Roses, from Kiss. Jimi Hendrix's brother to Kiss. We've had a ball. Make sure you're here next year. You'll be silly if you miss out. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, America. I love America. Hey, everybody. This is Nicole Rachel. I'm here at the IES, and I'm loving it. I'm loving the energy, the knowledge that I soaked up by big people in this industry. And they have taught us so much, and I'm just very thankful to be here. And the world is beautiful, beautiful place to be when you have people to support you, being an underground artist, an indie artist. And I just want to say thank you to everybody, and have a blessed day. Much love.
What's up, everybody? It's Tab C from Nashville, Tennessee. Listen to me. Indie Entertainment Summit is where it's at. I came here. I learned how to grow my fan base. All right. I had one-on-one -on -one meetings with industry tastemakers. These guys, I'm telling you, they've done big things. So if you're not at IES, you're not anywhere. It's like getting a PhD in the music industry direct from the people that that are making it happen. So you've got to do one thing. One thing right now is register for IES. Make sure that you're informed. And I'm going to see you here next year. Welcome back to The Road to Hollywood. Very special show tonight. We've been reminiscing about the rise of one of the most incredible rock bands in history. It is Guns N' Roses. We have people here that were there every step of the way. This is Mark Canner, growing up with Slash, writing the Reckless Road book, which you got to check out. It is one of the greatest documentations of the rise of any success story. And Vicki Hamilton, you just heard her band, The Art, and, and she is now managing... A few bands. She also does artist development. So if you guys are in a group and really want to have somebody work with you to develop what you have, she was right there. Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, Poison, some of the greatest rock success stories of all time. Live from the Sunset Strip. Vicki, tell us a little bit about some of the bands and uh, what, what you're doing today. Well, that band that you're holding in your hand is The Art. They're from Sydney, Australia. Um, they just got done touring with Faster Pussycat all over the United States. Then they went back to Australia and played the Stone Festival with um, Aerosmith and Van Halen. And um, they did some dates with Buck Cherry as well and Richie Ramone. And they're getting ready to go to Europe with Faster Pussycat this summer. So they're right. kind of well on their way and the band we heard at the top of the the show what was that they're called lucid dream factory they're my baby band and um they're kind of a dirty pop rock band and i'm just like now like interviewing producers to put together their demo but everybody that hears it loves it and um i'm really excited about how that's going to go down you know we're getting ready to make a video for the song that you heard forever 21 and um you know, they're they're a fun little band, and they're all under 25, so um, and very cute. All the girls like them. So. <laughs> well, that that's great. You know, we're all about the development of artists. You know, we, we put IES together because, you know, so many of those old-fashioned music conferences have all fallen away with the major labels, and now it's about being all you can be independent, and that's why we really bring people together and you know, we love the, the GNR reunion last year of just talking about, you know, the making of that classic album. This year, we've got the Rage Against the Machine guys, and we're talking about the making of their debut album. 20 years later, you know, they, they made that at, at Sound City. We've got uh, some very big um, honorees this year in our IES Rock Honors. We're going to honor Ozzy Osbourne and Randy Rhodes, bringing some very, very special people to the stage. Uh, reminiscing about you know Randy's guitar playing and you know those iconic albums that launched Ozzy into his solo success. We're also of course paying tribute to Black Sabbath that Ozzy's back in the group, first album in 35 years, and that magic. And also the Foo Fighters and Nirvana, and uh, we're paying tribute to that documentary that Dave Grohl made about Sound City and 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 the legendary music you know that those groups made. It's a made. great documentary. Yes, we we highly recommend it. And Motley Crue and Tell us a little bit about working with Nikki Six and, and, and that group, you know, because again, Guns N' Roses was their own, you know, machine. But what, what was some of the elements, you know, that uh, well, made Motley, Motley Crue? Well, Motley Crue was very special to me because it was the first band I worked that I saw go from local hero to, you know, worldwide fame. And, um, Nikki had a very clear cut vision of what he wanted to do. And, you know, years later, I'm still seeing the things that he wanted come true. So it's pretty amazing. Um, I also want to say that um, I consult bands, and you can go to my website, vickihamilton.com, and it's Vicky, V I C K Y. Um, 
And uh, I'm working on a musical right now called Glitter Beach, which is about a glam rock surfer dude coming of age. And we're hoping to get a new workshop up this year. And actually, Slash has been trying to help me place it as well. And I gave you another CD of a band called Hillbilly Herald. Hopefully, you'll get to share with them as well. Um, Hillbilly Herald's out with um, Steel Panther right now, but it's kind of like Slash's darling. And they are going out on the road with him this summer. That's great. Now, we know it's all about the songs, Mark, because you, you really made a point of when each one of these songs was premiered. You can be dangerous, you can be rock and roll, you can have the hair, the clothes, the guitars, and all that, but you're not going to be remembered if you don't have the songs. So I want both of you to, in closing, tell us a little bit about that advice to the new groups today on, besides writing great songs, what does it take to really stand out and be one of the best? Well, you have to be a great live band and be very entertaining. And today, as a band, you make money on merchandise and playing live shows. So, you know, you want to come up with the killer merchandise that everybody wants to buy because you're not going to make a lot of money selling records anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, I think you need an Im You need the like she said. You have to have a great live band that people w that can hold an audience. But the image is very important. How they dress, how they look, their sound. You know, vocals, lyrics, guitar playing, there's so much into it. A lot of bands will make it just on one of those elements because they get lucky they're really good at one thing. But I think if you have all of that, you have a much better chance. Social to media is very important, too. The fifth member of the band should be a really sharp social media person. <laughs> And there's a, a billion bands out there on social media. So, again, you've got to have your image. You've got to have your team together. You've got to be relentless from the live show to the logo, the merchandising, all your concepts. You've got to stand out. You know, uh, the, the first minute you kick back, there's another band that's hungrier than you that's going to take your spot. And, again, uh, we're so excited tonight to, again, go back in history and talk about the elements that really took this – Again, these scruffy kids from Indiana and West Hollywood and Seattle, and they ended up making one of the most iconic albums that will be listened to for decades from now. And they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're right in there with the Beatles and the Stones and all the great groups of all time. So, again, we uh, appreciate you guys coming in today. We look forward to having all you guys come check out IES again this year. The Indie Summit is where the future of, of music and entertainment is, and we're so glad to bring it you know, right here in Los Angeles. So no matter where you are, come check it out, IESFest, F-E-S-T dot com. And um, again, thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you so much, Mark. We look forward to having you on future shows and spreading the word on all the great bands and everything you do. And again, go get that book, Reckless Road. Thanks thank you so much. Thanks for having us as well. It's thank the you. road to Hollywood. See you next week. <laughs>